to support the production of today's radio program and to access extended episodes, please visit okpodcast.com slash subscribe. Thank you and enjoy the show. I was going as a classical major, but I thought I might try to play both sides. And when I was at New England Conservatory of Music, the president of the conservatory was Gunther Schuller, who was really the one who taught me the Duke Ellington adage, there are only two kinds of music, good music and the other kind. And it really has only to do with the evidence of the performer and the listener, which is what is good for you and why? You're listening to OK Podcast, a podcast by Sean Perrin about Radiohead. Sean Perrin about Radiohead. About Radiohead. About Radiohead. Welcome back to OK Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Perrin, and this is the show where I discuss the musical and cultural impact of the world's greatest band, Radiohead. On today's show, I had the incredible opportunity to speak with Christopher O'Reilly, who is an esteemed classical pianist, perhaps best known to Radiohead fans for having released two full albums of Radiohead transcriptions, one called True Love Waits and the other Hold Me To This. In fact, he does have more arrangements on some other CDs which he's released and also a lot more on his YouTube channel, so do check out his website and YouTube channel for more great transcriptions. We discuss how his arrangements came to be, how they have helped build bridges in both directions between the classical music and rock music realm, including a funny story about how classical fans were looking for a Mr. Head to discover his music, and some of the intricacies behind his arranging methods themselves. Christopher was kind enough to demonstrate some of what he's talking about on the piano as we chatted, which was an unexpected and very welcome surprise that I'm sure you're also going to really enjoy. If this is your first time here, welcome, and I hope that you enjoy the show. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so that you don't miss a single episode. And if you find yourself coming back for more, be sure to also tell all your Radiohead friends about it so we can sort of spread the Radiohead love around and I can take the show even further. I'd really appreciate that. Thank you so much for listening to OK Podcasts, and I hope that you do enjoy today's episode. If you have any feedback or would like to apply to be a guest on the show yourself or have any guest suggestions, send me a message at hello at okpodcast.com. That's hello at okpodcast.com. So I'm here today with the wonderful Christopher O'Reilly, who is coming to me today from L.A. Uh, he says right underneath the Hollywood sign. So first of all, I want to hear all about that interesting location. Oh, gosh. Well, I, I've had this house for about 20 years, and uh, or a little bit more than 20 years now, and I can literally see the Hollywood sign from my deck. And uh, it's just, uh, I, I, don't, I don't really think of places like, oh, gosh, I'd rather live in this city or that city. I, I don't really like L.A. that much as a city. I just love this house. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I suppose it could be anywhere. Uh, and actually, speaking of, of uh, home environs, uh, I was just in your neck of the woods for the first time ever. I'd, I'd been to Edmonton before, but I'd never been to Calgary. And I was just so overwhelmed with the, with the beauty of the place and, and just just loved, loved my time there. So there we are. I have to say it's so interesting social media these days because they're so good at getting some things out to you to see, but so bad at others. Like I was shocked to hear that you were playing here and presenting at a conference, which I wish I'd known about. Um, but then I was scrolling through my feed and I saw a picture of yours, as I often do. And I was like, wait a minute, that looks like Banker's Hall in the background. There's no way he's in Calgary. What's what's going on here? And uh, lo and behold, you were, you were staying downtown and uh, I hope you had a great time. Did you get a chance to try any of the restaurants in that area or go out to Banff at all or I, I, I would have loved to uh, my I, I, I'm actually traveling with grainless granola I'm on a I'm on a diet of nuts and berries that's doing me very very well so I'm actually I actually traveled with nuts and berries oh really <laughs> <laughs> actually no, you, know, you guys were, were great as far as the berries were concerned there was a superstore within walking distance so I got my raspberries blueberries blackberries uh, didn't have a knife for strawberries, so I, I, I decided to forego that. But no, I, I was very well taken care of. And actually, at the at the Regency Club, I, I decided to branch out and uh, adapt uh, smoked salmon to my morning routine. Uh, I usually don't eat anything in the morning, but uh, I'm doing my workout early in the morning. And in, in at Calgary, at the workout place uh, in the hotel, it was... I was doing it at 6.30 in the morning because we had to be, you know, up, up in the booth by 8. So, so I've, I've tried to, ad- I've had to adapt that, first of all, that uh, regimen here in L.A. because we've been 
in the 90s uh, this last week. And so if I wait any anywhere past nine o'clock, I'm really asking for it. And so um, so the, the other thing was that they had at the Regency Club, they had smoked salmon. And what a fantastic uh, protein source. And I could actually feel it accessible uh, while I was working out that early in the morning. It was really quite extraordinary. I should have. I wish I'd known. I would have brought you some of the the berries. We're growing strawberries on my balcony, so I. Oh, are you really? Could, could oh have brought gosh. some down. <laughs> That's the only thing I lack. So I and, know, and I know. Organic, hard. homegrown too. Wow. <laughs> I would have well, it. next time, next time. Yes, yes. Well, so, you know, it's really funny the way, um, you know, this came to be because I, uh, you know, noticed you were in Calgary of all places. It was really surprising. But um, it's actually kind of funny the way that I discovered your music. In fact, I discovered it twice, I believe. So when I was in university, you released your True Love Waits album. But I realized after listening to it for some time, like, wait a minute, I think I have another album here by... Christopher with James Galway. Um, so <laughs> I was like, so I realized because I was, I'd received the other one sometime before that. I had been listening to the flute music, of course, of Sir James Galway. And I was astonished to find that, that it was the same person. So I might have to have you on my other podcast as well at some point called Clarinet. I, I focus on the clarinet and I've talked to, I'd love to talk to you about being a collaborative pianist um, with with amazing performers like that. Um, but today, of course, we're going to focus on Radiohead, but that's kind of my interesting story. So I first discovered you actually on your classical side and then was thrilled to find out that you were covering some of my favorite music at the time when I was in high school, uh, everything basically from the, your True Love Waits album. So uh, fantastic. And I, I love that you've done all that over the years. And uh, so that's what we're going to focus on today. So Radiohead fans who are here, do not worry. We're not going to delve into the, uh, <laughs> the flute side of things <laughs> too much. But um, just for those amazingly who might not have heard from you or of you, could you just give a brief sort of introduction to your amazing career? Well, actually, the, the, as, as far as Radiohead is concerned, uh, in particular, that, that was really kind of life-changing. I was for many years a touring classical pianist, but I had started out um, in grade school realizing that girls weren't that impressed with oct fast octaves and the list Hungarian rhapsodies, and they were more into the the pop music my sister turned me on to the Beatles and I you know I, I you know liked them but it wasn't anything that really made me um, want to participate in the music <laughs> yeah but uh, but then I don't know I just I just decided well you know and it was a gosh a terrible time to to take as your springboard as a keyboardist in pop music because who did I have the doors I could I could play the I could play the organ solo to the to the light to light my fire you know and the end and all of that stuff and and was making up my own and people wondered well why would you do something like that why don't you just play what's on the record anyway so I, I was doing the doors we were doing Iron Butterfly I knew Inagata Devita Santana had a decent you know keyboard essence to it but yeah so I, I started getting into pop music that way and then started gravitating more to the art rock. Mahavishnu Orchestra, and then into jazz, and Miles Davis, Chick Corea, Keith Jarrett, McCoy Tyner. And so all this time I was really just sticking to the classical studies, but I was sort of interested in this in this other thing. And, and, and at the time, you know, I, I started out making this, this rock band, and, and then, you know, played uh, jazz professionally in high school when my family moved to Pittsburgh. And it was on the basis of that, that I went to New England Conservatory of Music in Boston for training because they had a really good classical and jazz department. Once I got there, I, I was going as a classical major, but I thought uh, I might try to play both sides. And, and they have a very serious jazz department there at New England, and it was very clear that all of the players that I revered had made, had forged their modern musical language out of a deep knowledge and participation in traditional jazz in all of its uh, manifestations. Um, when I was at New England Conservatory of Music, the president of the conservatory was Gunther Schuller, who, who was really the one who taught me the Duke Ellington adage, there are only two kinds of music, good music and the other kind and really has only to do with, you know, the, the evidence of the performer and the listener, which is what is good for you and why, uh, why, what makes it essential for me to play this music? 
and and do I need to be exclusive in in the kinds of music that I address? And likewise, do listeners uh, feel more comfortable listening to what they know? Do they want to try something new? Uh, what criteria do they have to judge good and bad music? So, uh, but the other thing that that was quite clear was, you know, as I say, all these players that I admired really knew the history of jazz and forged their playing out of it. I was just kind of dabbling on the on the modern end of their own playing. So I all of a sudden, I all of a sudden felt, felt like mm, I'd have to go back and reinvent the wheel as far as me and jazz is concerned. And I felt it was more invigorating and perhaps more challenging for me to revitalize the moments of the classical repertoire that I felt I could I could do in, in a way that no other no other player could so uh, I, I went that way for a long time and uh, and was touring and then came to uh, this radio program that I did for 20 years uh, for national public radio here in, in the US uh, called from the top which was a, a showcase for pre-college uh, classical musicians with whom I would collaborate on air and interview, and we would highlight their stories. And it would, it would basically be a variety program with five different musical acts per, per show. And it was wonderful how all of the audience members would gravitate to a different personality because we would be allowing them to, to present themselves as artists and as people. And, and that was that was quite trailblazing at the time because we were used to concerts as more rituals and they weren't about the contact between performer and, and uh, audience. And, and we kind of blazed the trail there. And now it's really an essential part of concert life, I believe. But in any case, we started out doing from the top, uh, wanting to make it a forum for all kinds of young performers, musical theater, uh, rap, gospel, folk, you know, anything. And, and when we were shopping the show around, it was like, oh, you play one minute of jazz, mister, and you are off, you know, because it was basically a classical constituency. The, the U S classical market was, was basically who we were pitching to, despite the fact that we, we have, we have as much percentage of talk to playing that, that would have qualified us for any of the, any of the news uh, markets, which became much more you know, accessible and amenable in, in later days. In any case, I digress. So we would have the halfway point of our hour-long weekly broadcast, and there would be a moment which, which would either be played by our participating stations or would be broken away from uh, for t to take care of local business, you know, station identification or uh, local, uh, local announcements of some sort or another. And so we didn't want our young guests to be at the whim of our local stations, whether they would be heard or not. So that became the opportunity for me to play a solo every week. And so when I ran out of, you know, two-part inventions and Chopin preludes, I, I thought, well, you know, why not uh, get, uh, get cracking on some of this music that I've been obsessed with since, the, since OK Computer came out, 1997. And I started doing uh, these arrangements of, of Radiohead and, and Nick Drake and Elliot Smith. And actually, the first time that I played a Radiohead set uh, for, a, for a real big audience was for uh, the NPR program Performance Today, sort of a magazine format, which would occasionally uh, do live performances at their studio in Washington, D.C., and I went on, and um, Fred Child, I believe, was the host. Uh, I was I was there playing Radiohead, and Nick Drake, and Rameau, and Shostakovich, I believe. And uh, that show was then in turn linked to 150 Radiohead and rock-related websites around the world, literally around the world. It was. I think maybe a day or two after that, that I got a phone call from Sony saying, you know, is this something that you're interested in touring and recording? And you know, yes, yes, and yes. And so we were off and running at that point. That's crazy. And you know what? It's, it's ironic though, because you mentioned the reason for kind of 
when you were younger, switching to this type of music was because uh, List was not attracting the ladies or something like that. But back in the day, like, weren't they famously throwing themselves at him? And, and <laughs> you know, we're, we're. it's yeah. so unfair. Yeah. It's what so happened? Unfair. <laughs> what happened throughout history? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very it's very interesting. But, you know, and I love the thing you said, too, about, you know, there's good music and the other kind. And it makes me think of a really absurd thing that happened to me when I was in my performance degree. A professor for some reason he had a bit of a thing out for me but he didn't like that I really liked pop music I really loved Radiohead I really loved uh, Sigur Ross and many of these other bands at the time and but one day he took my iPod and he looked through all the songs and he said you should quit music this is, this is not for you there's not enough Bach and Beethoven and whatever else in the iPod and I was like but it's my iPod like that's what I'm listening to on the bus to and from school that I'm enjoying who cares what I listen to this is all music this is but I was shocked that a, a music history professor would say something like that and uh, it always struck me, though, because I was like, these, some of these people in classical music are so fixated on just what they know and what they do, they refuse to listen to other things. Like, I know people who go on road trips and, and will, like, listen to Ravel piano concertos the entire time. And they don't even know of the joy of listening to an album like OK Computer. So I want to step back a little bit and just find out, like, for someone with your musical prowess and, and understanding, like, what grabs you about Radiohead that doesn't grab these other people or maybe they don't have some kind of gateway like you did as far as the playing the funk and the fusion music like what is it that allowed you to see these things in the music that other people don't or don't choose to see well i i think i i come from a very uh rarefied posture in that i think there are there are a couple of essential characteristics of all music that i love harmony that is to say some kind of mechanism and chemical reaction between harmonies that, you know, puts a tingle down your spine. Something like, for instance, in a Ravel piano concerto, you know, the, the whole second movement of the Ravel G major piano concerto. I mean, that's harmony and, and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it takes you over. And so, uh, so there are some songs of Radiohead that, that really, you know, catch my interest. Even, even just, um, I mean, no, we're not talking about form or format, but there is something actually symphonic about Radiohead's music. In particular, the, the best of their songs always have a, th a three, a three part, you know, it's not like verse and refrain. It's like verse, refrain and, and, and synthesis. Like Karma Police, that C section with the... It's a, yeah, this, the C, it's all about, for me, it's all about the C section. And, and, and so, but, but to backtrack, the, th the thing that is in common with all music that I love is harmony and texture. And so uh, that uh, Shostakovich prelude and fugue, Bach preludes and fugues, all of these things are interweavings of voices. Whereas a lot of pop music is very vertical and very, you know, at its best, I mean, you know, power chords, I mean, you know, what, what can be improved there? But the fact is that what makes me interested in terms of music that I choose to interact with is the interweaving of voices. And regardless of the fact that I think maybe, what, two out of the five members of Radiohead can actually read music, that does not preclude them from each contributing something integral, motivically, to every song that they do. It's why it's why you see that you know the the composers listed exactly as they are songs by Radiohead by all five of them, and you can hear it. You can hear the the you know Phil's beat. You can hear this funny little blues oriented bass line. You know, no matter what kind of artsy thing you know uh, Johnny is doing. You know, there, there's there's Colin. You know, just roots player, total roots player, and Ed. You know. Who knows what Ed does, you know? But, but <laughs> he's got a he's got a credit. But anyway, it's, <laughs> it's texture. It's texture. It's all about the interweaving of voices and how that, for me, made it in many cases really easy to make these arrangements. Something like something as complex that some that Tom York refuses to play most of time. Most of the time is let down. It's probably one one of my favorite Radiohead song but is something that really kind of wrote itself i mean you know that's it's just 
just this kind of mandala and and then the the harmonic uh motion can be used as the backdrop for that mandala and all kinds of things present themselves texturally by what the band does and what each member contributes to each song and and so that's that's the case harmony and texture with bach with radiohead with Elliot Smith, you know, somebody who is completely self-produced uh, texture, is somebody uh, like Nick Drake, who is all, it's all about his funny tunings. And for me, as a pianist, it was all just so easy because I could just get into his patterns. I wouldn't have to figure out what the tuning was. I just got into his, the glove of his patterns. So it's been, it's been really exciting working on this music, but essentially there are those two characteristics that are at base of all of my musical decisions. That's so interesting. And I, I definitely agree with the uh, Elliot Smith and Nick Drake in particular, two just fantastic. Like Elliot is just such a Baroque guitarist in a way. Like his music is so uh, ornate and amazingly so like Independence Day. That's just an incredible, incredible track. And I, I love to see actually on your Elliot Smith album that you did Coast to Coast, which is one of my favorite songs too. Such a really rich, like heavy, different song for him. And of course it was produced posthumously, but um you know, it's what you say is so interesting because I think that if many people in the classical side of things would reframe their ear just a little bit and, and listen for some of these things, they would find it sometimes. And they're not maybe going to hear it on a radio song, but yeah. you might hear it in a radio head song, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, But it's true, too, though. Like Even like I, I had a couple years ago, I had a really strange phase where I was like driving around listening to Ace of Bass because like something about the production and the extreme simplicity – and the idea of reaching that peak that the masses are interested in, even though it's simple to your ear or, or any musician's ear, there's something about that point of perfection, which is almost impossible to reach, even for a very you know astute producer trying to produce that type of music. So, yeah, I mean, for us, it maybe is not harmonically interesting and this and that, but like there's something about finding a sound. I guess the truth is that like a lot of classical musicians, they never find their way to the other side, but a lot of pop fans or even Radiohead fans, I hate to say it, um, a lot of avant-garde rock fans, even who like Yes and things like that, they never find their way to the classical side either. So it's kind of too bad that we have this sort of sided music now where people like jazz or they like classical or they like Britney Spears or whatever, you know? It, it gets even more splintered and I don't see the point of it, you know, because this music should be joyful. And thank goodness we are in a place that is embracing of all genres at this point. I mean, how, how it's not so long ago that everybody was just hunkered down waiting for their favorite band's next record. And now who, who would ever think like that anymore? It's, it's wonderful. Me, I'm waiting for Radiohead's. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But it has been five years. So I don't think they're, I don't think they're going to make another record. Do you? I don't think so either. That's really too bad. But I think true love waits was kind of a finish. A silent finish. Yeah, Moonshape Pool is wonderful and and uh, and and very keyboard heavy. You're welcome, Tom. And and so yeah, that was. <laughs> and, and and but you know, I I I was I was lo- losing the thread way back, but but I kind of swore Tom off when I saw Suspiria. So that was that was the end for me. I, I just got the feeling that he's got one too many yes men around him. Meanwhile. Johnny's trajectory as the preeminent film composer of our time, you know, isn't that amazing? That is, well, it's, it's, it's not amazing. It's just like hard, extraordinary work with a director now that he's been working with for what, 10, 15 years. DT Anderson. Uh, it's just astonishing what, what you can achieve in that kind I mean, you know, similar to, you know, Tim Burton and Danny Elfman, you know, we, we can point to other other partnerships. Almodovar has his favorite. You know, all, all of the really great directors have really strong connections with composers. And I'm really thrilled to see Johnny and hear Johnny doing such great work. Well, it's interesting you say about the just the too many releases almost maybe on, on Tom's side of things, because I, I think that other artists that I appreciate the most, they tend to limit their output. I think Radiohead's nine albums and the couple EPs and stuff really is a great career. And I hate to say it as an ardent fan, but like I would kind of be okay with it being left there. I would kind of have been okay with <laughs> Hills of the Thief actually being the end to me. I, I know that's kind of a com- controversial opinion, but there's many bands like Yes that went way too far. They have 50 records, 
you know, they're still making records and it's still the same sound. And so I, in a way, I appreciate that it's a concise, like, it fits on your bookshelf. <laughs> you know, you can get to know every every version of every song that's there, and then that's kind of it. You know, I I I I thought they you know jumped the shark at Hail to the Thief too, and and I'm now I'm, I'm completely blanking. If we didn't have Hail to the Thief, though, we would never have had In Rainbows, right? Yes, that's true. And I think there's not a real splintering of the Radiohead audience insofar as realizing that that is a record very much on par with OK Computer. And so it's, we're not dealing with some kind of downward tra- trajectory necessarily in a, in a, in a, in a eventual, in, a, uh, in an inevitable fashion. It's funny because so many people are so in love with that record and I do like it, but I find that for me, it gravitated away from, I think the Kid A amnesiac sound that for me really defined what I loved about Radiohead. And I kind of went back to that more rock sound. So while the song forms, I find them interesting and the songs themselves are interesting. It's just, to me, the core of Radiohead is kind of that Kid A, Amnesiac, Hail to the Thief era. For some reason in my head, it's like, I guess it's when I was in high school. That was just like the, the, the peak of, of what it was for me. But, but that's, that's not taking into account, Sean, that, that, you know, that the Benz remains the best guitar rock record ever made. Oh, that's undoubtable too, though. Oh no, the whole arc of Radiohead's career. Yeah, I mean, but 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 if you, if you don't take that into account, you can't, you know, you can't see In Rainbows as a, a wonderful return, you know, slightly in, in with new technology to that type of song making. As soon as I ever heard Tom beatbox, I just said, "Don't do that." <laughs> but I'm not sitting in the producer's booth, and it's like, oh no. Is he still doing? I'm going to go get a. Let me know when he's finished with this. You know, oh my God. It's interesting because I think that the the uh, the guitarist side of things for Radiohead, like they've transitioned through so many different types of music. That's another actually incredible feat. So you're right. The ability to come back and like reflect back on and refine something they'd sort of already done, and make like a version two almost of that is also incredible. And they do say there's some link between OK Computer and In Rainbows, even with the title and something to do with binary. And I don't think anyone's really figured it out. It's one of those things which will maybe not be figured out um, exactly. But uh, no, it's a, it's. I think it's definitely a fan favorite. But my fan favorite is Kid A. <laughs> yeah. I, I, would have, I would have to say, you know, if, if I were talking about not skipping one track, Kid A would also be my, would also be my favorite. Even Tree Fingers? Yeah. No, I love tree yeah. fingers. Yeah. 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 So I was on a thread there, which I want to just come back to real quick. There's some people that I know who discovered your music um, because of Radiohead, of course. They were Radiohead fans. And then they discovered True Love Waits, which is your album of Radiohead covers. And it was kind of like a gateway to classical for them. They now ended up listening to more kind of classical music. Was this one of the intents of creating that album of arrangements? Or was it just a result that was kind of a happy accident? Or did you realize that was occurring? Or it was a very happy result. Um, as, as I said, you know, I, I, I was just doing it because it was music that I suddenly wanted to be, you know, inhabiting and, and playing. And, and I all of a sudden had a very long short list of pieces that I definitely wanted to do. Uh, and that became also the case with Elliot and with Nick Drake and then with, with lots of other bands as well. The, the interesting sort of cross-pollinization of, of audiences there, there were, there are still, you know, I, I mean, I just played a, a, a radio headset here in LA at the end of July. And there are still people who say, you know, I, I really like your version better. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I've never liked Tom York's voice. They say, and it's like, Oh my God, that's so sad. But, but there, I mean, it just goes back to what we were saying about the splintering of the audience. Some people can't get, Oh, his lyrics are so depressing. I mean, it's, it's amazing what criteria people decide. Oh, he's such a sad sack. Oh, you know, you know, why doesn't he bathe? You know, what people <laughs> will gravitate on, um, yeah. it, it really just, it, it boggles the mind, you know, how anybody can end up liking any music. But, but, but there, there's all kinds of wonderful cross pollinization. I mean, I, I played a, a, a Chopin concerto with a, the Pacific Symphony down in Orange County a few years back. And I played uh, airbag as an encore, and I, a girl was coming back to to meet me, and we were going to run off, and and she's standing at the elevator, 
with next to a little old lady with with a little blue bun and who's whisp, who's whistling airbag you know who 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 would have thought you know that was happening so there's there's all kinds of folks that are crossing over in all kinds of ways i love that you would play that as a surprise at that type of venue and that they could appreciate it you know that's so i bet that some of those people if you told them what it was maybe you did announce the piece but but um they would be surprised to learn that the origins of that and and that the complexity um so i guess one thing i would ask about too so what is your method for deciding which pieces you want to play in this way are they the ones that excite you musically the most or you think they're the most relevant for kind of radiohead's catalog i mean you tend to draw on a lot of the um the pieces like how i made my millions which are really interesting b-sides which not a lot of people know so it's it's interesting to me that you include those so how do you go about deciding and, and making your arrangements well actually uh, one more blasphemous thing in, in the encore department okay <laughs> my most my most popular encore is you which yeah. is from pablo honey and i i, I I'm, I'm told I'm not really allowed to play anything from Pablo Honey, but I just wanted to tie that <laughs> up in a bow. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm able to come out and, and preface that by saying, this is the only pop song I know in 23-8. So. <laughs> what do you mean you're not allowed to play anything from Pablo Honey? That's... I, well, in, in terms of, you know, again, talking about the splintering of our audience. Oh, I uh, see. Yeah. They, People don't like to hear that. I, you know, I well, love you. That's not, a great... not, even the band, not even the band acknowledges that record anymore. It's a great yeah. record, though. I love you. Yeah. I agree. It's a yeah. great song. There's some energy about it too. It's like this is the start of their career, really, and and uh, you know, it's a great song. And it has, it has a great gritty quality, and it has a great expansive quality. I mean, the the big bigness of the musical gestures, and the and the punk rock energy is just uh, irresistible. I think it's a, so. I, that's part of you know what gets me in. I mean, it's always a matter of which song I've listened to how many hundreds of times. And then it's a matter of finding out what the way in is. And I, I loved, for instance, in How I Made My Millions, the sort of out of tune aspect of him, of Tom playing on, on, the, home, on the home upright. And I, I started getting into the idea of, of what it would sound like to add the overtones, you know, the, the sort of like out, out of tune overtones to to his, you know, and then, you know, so that just became this sort of halo of, of overtones and then became uh, what, what we play with for the rest of the arrangement. So in that, in that regard, it was, that's one of my more modern arrangements because I, st I, I start out with the song as a springboard and then there's a lot more actual composition going on rather than transcription. Similar to um, the uh, Glass Eyes arrangement. Yes, yeah. Which, which I think is, I mean, I think it's about two measures of Radiohead and, of course, all of the, the melody and harmony, but the rest is just all invention, and I love that. Then, you know, the, some of the most successful are the most true. I mean, as I said, Let Down, you know, just basically wrote itself. Things like uh, 2 plus 2 is 5, really was like a Zenakis piece putting that together because I always insist on creating all of the color within a moment. And that includes notes of the harmony, notes adjacent to the harmony, overtones of uh, the jangly, you know, uh, acoustic guitar or the feeding back electric guitar, the, the cymbals, how the symbols sound, I think it leaves the door open to other harmonic possibilities in a sort of a Scriabinesque, uh, synesthetic kind of way. I remember I, I also did a, I did an arrangement of Nirvana's song, Heart Shaped Box. I never thought I would do um, a punk rock song. And then I thought of, there were a couple of things that contributed to it, but one was the idea of, of having a, a, a Jeremy type, you know, dysfunctional child who creates the perfect black by filling every square inch of a piece of construction paper with every crayon in the box. And so that the blackness would be a culmination of all of this riot of color. And so I started with that in mind, like Messian and like Scriabin, that, that the, the, 
color would come from the harmony and the extensions of the harmony. And, and so uh, it became synesthetic. So it became like we were actually seeing parts of the darkness in the color. And so that became that this sort of cluster, cluster type uh, harmonization that I was doing. Actually, that I stole from my own version of Paranoid Android, because in Paranoid Android, there are uh, sections that Tom, you know, shouts. He doesn't sing. And so what do you do in that situation? And then also there, there is uh, Johnny's uh, famous, you know, sort of cluster solo, uh, you know, you know the, at the end. Those, I mean, those are, I mean, if you do you want to transcribe those notes, seriously, is that going to help you? <laughs> so, so in both of those cases, I come up with some very specific clusters. And, and, and for, for Tom's shouting, again, it's, it's cluster based. And so with that in mind, I, I, I started working on the harmonies for uh, the heart-shaped box arrangement. I then was thinking about uh, an anecdote that I heard one of our young composers on From the Top tell of his teacher, who said that a good piece is a great balance between novelty and familiarity. So in other words, the idea of having this novel chorus but which was just so harrowingly dark that it was like being at the top of a roller coaster and you just, you know, it's happening and you know, it's going to happen again too. But the, having the familiarity of that particular novelty really makes that a very successful arrangement, even as atonal as it is. We had uh, the day that I premiered that we were doing a show uh, outside of San Antonio, Texas, I believe. And one of our young pianists was um, totally homeschooled. I think he was raised about an hour and a half outside of San Antonio, so really quite isolated in Texas. And uh, reading his pre-interview, he just, you know, they're always putting in these questions, you know, uh, oh, so what, when you let your hair down, you know, what kind of music do you listen to? You know, they're trying to find some kind of relatability to all of these guests. It was quite evident that he, there was none of he never listens to anything but classical music. He doesn't, you know, doesn't play anything but classical music. It was just, you know, he's very, he was a very religious young man. And, um, you know, it was, it was really a matter of, of ideology almost that he was not listening to anything else. So he was backstage with my producer waiting to go on stage himself as I was playing Heart Shaped Fox for the first time. <laughs> and he turned to him and said, I want to play that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's it's one of those things like so people are so confused or um, like they get into their own kind of mindset about things and they, they sometimes I don't say it's branding, but it kind of is branding like they know that's pop music. I saw a really funny YouTube video last night, which is very timely for right now. Apparently they rebranded a Payless Shoes and they called it Palessi. And they had everyone come in and a bunch of influencers and they were paying like six, eight hundred bucks for these shoes. And at the end, they would tell them, look, did you know this was Payless? We just like ripped off the sticker and they were all shocked. <laughs> so I think a lot of like classical people, if you played a piece like that and they didn't know about Nirvana and you told them what, you know, this is, a, this is, a, you know, Scriabin or whatever, <laughs> you made up some great composer. If you told them it was Beethoven, they would, they would love it. Well, even better, we would get, we would get email into the radio program uh, because my announcer would back and would post announce each of the pieces that I would play. That was our host, Christopher O'Reilly playing Karma Police by Radiohead. And we would get email into the show saying, assuming that I, as a classical pianist, was playing some classical music. And they wrote in excitedly saying, who is this Mr. Head and where can I find more of his beautiful music? <laughs> so No way. Just, more, no, absolutely true story. That's hilarious. Mr. Mr. Head. <laughs> Mr. Head. Mr. Head. I love very that. Very wonderful to me over the years, yes. Well, so your music has become a staple for all those who appreciate Radiohead. I mean, I remember back in the CD days, which I can't believe I'm saying, but, you know, 20 years ago, anyone who was collecting Radiohead would always go looking for your CD too and find it at a classical shop. Or it, was, it was part of building your Radiohead collection was, was finding a copy of True Love Waits, right? And then I remember when uh, the other one came out a few years later. So the fans clearly appreciate what you're doing and, and, and love it. And as many classical players are discovering it too. But have you ever found out what the band thinks? Have you heard from them? I went backstage at Madison Square Garden, I think in, I think the year that True Love Waits came out, 
uh, first person I, I I somehow snuck backstage, you know, uh, taking one of their managers' name in vain, and and so, <laughs> I, so I met Colin, and 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 he he said, oh, "We know who you are, and we're very excited about what you're doing." And so I just had a brief moment with him, and the only other person that night was Tom, and I I ended up talking to Tom at length. I mean, he didn't say i'm so excited about it. but but we were talking about all of the songs that we loved for instance i was i was talking to him about lift and i had just done an arrangement of the the old version i think 1997 or 1996 isn't it uh yeah six yeah and um he said that's good because the new one's crap oh <laughs> and <laughs> And somebody at Tony had been sort of uh, after me to try and, you know, make an opportunity to to do a duet with Tom. And so I, I said, you know, the most uh, quintessential piano vocal song of Radiohead is Pyramid Song. But I could never imagine recording it without the sound of your voice. And he said, oh, you mean without me fucking it up? <laughs> so that, was, that was his you know, his charming self deprecating mood, which is what I saw at that point. Um, and so that, that was really the only conversation that we had. We ran into each other uh, a couple of years later at a, a festival in um, Amsterdam. And as it happened, uh, I was good friends with REM's manager. So uh, we bought ticket to the Radiohead show and then the next night was REM, and so I had access to the REM show and the backstage, which started long before and included Radiohead. So all the band were there, and and photographers and all kinds of folks. And so at that point, you know, I, there were other other members of the band. I finally got to talk to Ed, Phil, God, the most charming, elegant man you will ever meet in your life, and. And, you know, my girlfriend and I were up till three in the morning. So, oh, my God, Johnny's hair, it's, it's so soft. What does he do? You know, it's like, <laughs> and still incredulous, you know, still scratching our heads at three in the morning. What is it that Ed does? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, exactly. Right. But, um, <laughs> but so so that but that that's my sum total of, of contact with the band. Well, it's funny you say about a collaboration because I was listening to your True Love Waits um, just yesterday, preparing for this again, and uh, it made me think how much I prefer your version, and I wish I could hear like that at the end of the album with Tom's voice over top. That would be truly an amazing way to have ended um, ended that album. I think so. I mean, I, and I, I like to think that there's a there's a wonderful commonality to the way they made that record and the way I'm making music now which has to do with Radiohead and has to do with Bach. Most specifically, and, and trying to be most simple about it, the idea that um, when we play by ourselves, we are the masters of time and space. Um, and when I was making uh, True Love Waits, when I was listening to master takes of each song, there were some takes that it was quite clear I was very focused on the beat. And there were other other takes where it was clear I was focused on the melody, really shaping the melody. And and the beat, it's not like the beat went away anywhere, but I could tell that there was a focus on the melody that was very attractive. And so fast forward to um, this Bach method that I, I came to, and the idea of just playing solo music in general, and, and the idea of a prelude as a Baroque form was essentially an improvisation. I mean, you have this. Are, are you telling me that you're a good boy if you play exactly in that tempo and in that way for the remainder of the piece? Is, is that what you think Bach's ingenuity is about? What, about? what about the idea of using this as an echo? So in other words, we could play it softer the second time, but we could also play it a, a little bit more spaced out. And very important to consider when, if he was playing on, on the harpsichord, he would be unable to play an echo effect. He would have to do it by way of time. So you see that there, I'm, I'm doing very little in terms of dynamic, but I'm doing everything in terms of spacing. 
So when, when we're playing with an orchestra, we have to be in lockstep with them. That's the only way that we can stay together. But when we play our cadenza, and these kids would play on my show all the time, and, and they would be like off and running, but they would be playing by themselves. And they would come to a place where they'd be trying desperately to make a big leap. And a big, I said, you are not playing with anyone. The composer is giving you this moment as, a, as an invitation to be the master of time. Take the time that you need to make that sound. The, the, the conductor will know when to come in because you will have finished all of your business. But in the meantime, this is, this is all focused about making the sound in the time that you need. And so then I started looking at my own playing and something as kinetic as the Beethoven concerto. And of course, you know, we, we can think of the Beethoven third, third concerto and say, yeah, be free with the cadenza. But I was deciding to take every measure that was unaccompanied and say, Hey, what are you going to do? You know, what can you do? The composer is saying there is no need for synchronicity here, synchronization here. Uh, this is your time to, if you want to bend the fabric of time to a particular need, I'm saying, I'm, I'm leaving you open for it. Then, <laughs> extrapolate from that, you're playing solo music entirely. What's the rush? What's the rush? I mean, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of Beethoven's music that works on a kinetic basis uh, because it's exciting to keep that kind of momentum. But at the same time, Bach, as we say, it's, it's an improvised form, the prelude. I mean, there's a whole world of things you can do in there. Uh, just the idea of, of 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 holding some notes rather than others and doing it in some harmonies and not others is a whole other realm of decision making that that I think he was asking us to engage in. And so with that in mind, I've well I've recorded on on all of these virtual instruments that I'm able to access via my Casio through Piano Tech, Piano T E Q which is a French company that has libraries of porta pianos, harpsichords, concert grands. I'm, I'm presently playing on a, a stack of a Steinway and a Beckstein concert grand. And that, and that gets into the whole idea of, of how, how wonderful it would be now to go on the road with, this, with the Radiohead music, because I can now play on a stack of Steinways, whereas I was usually relegated to, let's say, the only piano at South by Southwest was at... The Elephant Room, a kawaii, a six-foot kawaii. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now I could bring in a stack of Steinways. Anyway, but um, I recorded the whole well-tempered clavier as the virtually tempered clavier. I would play on a different virtual instrument. And they're very, very free. And so when I was doing my Radiohead show in July, I, first of all, I was going to be doing this, uh, making using this tech setup in a live setting that I had not done since I adapted it. Adopted it, and I had a sound guy ready to go with the column speakers and filling in. And we were playing in a cathedral. You know, it could have gone very wrong. It could have just sounded like a swimmy mess. And yet, uh, it was the best sound that I've ever had for a piano recital. And and the the other really neat thing about it was I showed up and we were, I was, I was doing the show and we'll, we'll share the video. Uh, we, we shot some video of, this was for candlelight concerts. And so I, I was on stage with 3000 candles. It's a great visual that they do for this series of concerts. They do all kinds of music. Um, and they do it in 90 cities around the country, around the world actually. And so they were doing this one in LA and I showed up with my Casio and I'm thinking, well, do I set up you know, in profile, like I would at a, at a piano recital. And they said, well, no, no, just face forward. And so I'm sitting like I am to you. I'm facing the audience for the first time ever. And even though it's a cathedral, that connection is palpable in a way that this is not. Who was it that moved the piano? Because traditionally, wasn't the piano recital played face on and then it switched? There was actually a guy in the 19th century who decided... My profile's better. 
<laughs> and, and that was it. So people want to see the hands or something, yeah, instead no, of the face. Hands, yeah. or, but but basically, it was his profile. It was his vanity that did, that made that change. And so changing it this this the other way around. Yes, they can see the hands and they can see my whole face. I'm not playing to the audience, but that's a connection that was never there before. And and the idea of being able to access this kind of magnificent sound and actually make a different instrument. If we want to play How I Made My Millions on Tom York's Out of Tune Upright, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> I can play, actually, I can play on, a, on, a, on an even better approximation of that. I can play it on an 1852 New York Steinway Square Grand, which just sounds really funky. But can you have someone cutting cucumbers in the background, though? <laughs> right. right. So, so, but the thing is, with with, with uh, Moon Shaped Pool in general, and and True Love Waits and uh, Glass Eyes, they're not playing to a click track. They are playing. They are. He is accompanying himself as he wishes to be accompanied. As the as the vocal is come as the lyric is coming out of his mouth. That determines, I mean, that's why there's no drums on the record, because it's all this, it's it's a very classical record, very keyboard oriented record, but it's very classical in terms of the, the, the flexibility of time, the rubato, the, 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 the flexibility, yeah, really the flexibility of the time, and taking responsibility and making that as much a part of the creativity as possible. There's so, so many pop records that you know it started because the click track started. Yeah. Actually, some, some Elliot Smith songs, you can actually hear that as the, as the track goes away. Yeah. I know. But, but the thing is, uh, this, this affected me, and the work that I was doing on Bach affected the way I was playing Radiohead and affected the way I was playing it for this concert because I was then really making my focus the lyric line and creating an environment that would make the lyric line sing. And when you get bigger, uh, when you get excited, get bigger. You know, I was always in the habit of getting excited and getting, you know, sort of letting it move and roll. And and God, isn't that exciting to feel that way? As I expand, I can, you know, I can make those harpsichords and those forte pianos sound like a stack of concert grants, not by the virtue of the fact that I'm just turning the amp up, I'm making the space more expansive. So you mean like instead of speeding up with excitement, you're getting kind of like louder and filling the... Right. Yeah, you know, some of the best moments in music are like that, actually. They don't accelerate into the finale. They kind of just like rest into it, you know? It's it's, it's the breadth of it. It's, it's really the dark matter between the notes that we choose to create tension, to create excitement, to create a sense that we are in control. Not just doing something willfully, just to be something, do something, you know, uh, some idiosyncrasy, but to say, yes, I want this to be really exciting, so I'm going to get broader here, and I'm going to do it in a way that I'm going to be sticking these infinitesimal millisecond slivers between each note, and nobody's going to know it except they're going to know that I'm connecting with them, and they're going to know that they're, they're not going to be they're not going to be tapping their foot to it because it's not going to be possible to tap your foot to it but they're going to be riveted to it. Well, I can hear that. Actually, it's one thing I like about your interpretations is other pianists, I find they'll play it and they're playing it properly, but they don't seem to notice that the vocals on a Radiohead album are never like fully in line with the beat. And you seem to pull the music along with the vocals and the vocal on your interpretations is always very vocal. (laughs) I can hear the vocals. um, I can hear the words and I can feel the actual music behind it, even though it's being kind of reinterpreted. But I have to say that sometimes I don't actually feel that in other other artists because they're just so focused on, like you said, the tempo, and then they're trying to slot the the words in where they might fit them. Yes. Well, one one of the other really big things in, that I found in, in my Bach method was I was listening to Bach and reading his a biography of his, and it just hit me. He was primarily a composer of vocal music, and there is no more expressive instrument on earth than the human voice. And so my thought was, you know, and, and playing it on the harpsichord, playing it on the piano, it, it's not a question of that. It's really a question of there are as many possible articulations on the piano or the harpsichord as there are consonants in any sung language. And we have to strive for that. We have to really, it, it wasn't like when Bach wrote for the keyboard, he suddenly became inexpressive. 
what did he do? And, and more importantly, what did he do on the harpsichord? And so I've been able to access that and working all of these pieces on the harpsichord first to see what was possible on that instrument. So it's, it's really, you know, it's about the freedom and it's about, you know, accessing that kind of space and allowing the voice to do the talking. And I also had the, had the, uh, the pleasure of doing a, a record of arrangements with Matt Heimovitz, the cellist, who was really great at two things. One was making me think of these songs not as a succession of verses as a pop song would be, but in terms of how a classical piece would be, uh, would be done. In other words, there would be a succession of verses, but they would be an, an evolution of a theme. There would be a progression. And so, so the, the later verses would have to have some sense of recapitulation or catharsis to, to really qualify. So that was wonderful because it, it really led me to, to really think of them in terms of that kind of arc. And the other thing was that he, he played the cello, and which is, the, which is, I think, the closest thing to the human voice that we can get in a, in a played instrument. You're talking a lot about like your composition methods and, and your arrangement, arranging methods and, uh, you know, your deep understanding of music. And it makes me wonder. I also interviewed Steve Hackman on this program. Do you know who that is? The name is familiar. He does. Does he do that Bach Radiohead thing? Uh, the Brahms versus Radiohead thing, which is like a it's a sort of it's kind of a mix of like Brahms and OK Computer. But it, you know, it, it works out um, you know differently for different people, I guess. But more kind of what I'm thinking is like. Have you ever thought of doing a long form type of more classical style piece based on Radiohead's themes and more kind of in the style of, let's say, Philip Glass, Low Symphony or um, like Reich's or Reich's Radio Rewrite? Has this ever kind of been on your mind? I mean, I'd be very interested in like a symphony based around themes from Kid A or or something like that, you know? That's a really interesting idea. Um, and I think I think it would be fun to do something like that. It's It's funny how everything that I choose to do changes everything from what I was doing before. For instance, um, I, I'm not doing any, any pop arrangements of any sort, and I don't really have any on my agenda. But uh, for a friend, I'm, I'm working on a, a set of East European folk songs. And one of them was really, really simple, the first one I started with. And it, it has become this real Byzantine thing, and I'm thinking, I would never have guessed that it was going to take this direction. And yet it has this sense of inevitability about it. Uh, and then I'm going back and listening to the second song that I will address next. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I thought the first one was simple. This one is going to be a total mindfuck. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's kind of, in, it's just interesting where my mind is going to go next. I, I had no idea that I was going to go in this direction for instance, until it happened. And, and there have been some discoveries over the last couple of years. I mean, I did a bunch of, of pieces by Sun Kill Moon, you know, Mark Kozlek. And I did, you know, on commission, I did a, a Disney song. I did a song from Alice in Wonderland uh, that I never thought I would do. And, and yet it was probably the best thing that I have done <laughs> as it ended up. So I'm I'm always encouraged by the fact that yeah I can I can still engage in this sort of way and it has something very specific to the piece to say I, I like that I've never I've never really been tempted to make a piano and orchestra thing I, you know I, I I really don't approve of the Steve Hack, Hackman thing I, I think it's just opportunistic but I just I just it just doesn't I don't think that that would give me the same kind of energy well wouldn't give me the same kind of energy as playing a chopin concerto with orchestra and following it with you know okay yeah. computer <laughs> yeah yeah well it's interesting you say about the steve hackman because i went and saw it and uh I, I wasn't sure what i was expecting and i did talk to him on this program so i want to be respectful of that but i found strangely enough that the opening pieces he did a cover of like there there and a couple other songs with the orchestra i found them so compelling and kind of interesting and fun but i uh i feel that the actual concert though like the Brahms versus Radiohead like it was just kind of a sort of strange clashing that I wasn't entirely comfortable with either I would have loved if it was like a Radiohead symphony <laughs> you know um, but I, I did enjoy the, the the concert as far as like the 
I guess that that genre being mixed with those sounds and that I was familiar with, and it was a sold out house. So like whatever they're the idea is is it is introducing people to the classical, but yeah, I agree. It's kind of a bit of a weird sort of mashup that I'm not sure it was ever intended to be that way on either behalf. Well, I think I think it was a it was a project that was uh, that was well intentioned. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, it's it's funny because you mentioned too a few minutes ago something about uh, finding the perfect point between stretching the boundaries and and staying within them, but yet introducing something new. And uh, there was a uh, Brad Osborne. Have you read his book about Radiohead? Everything in its right place. He calls this the Goldilocks effect, and he thinks it's why Radiohead's so successful. Because they and pop music have found this point where they're pushing just enough to kind of expand people's minds, but never too far, you know. And I think that's a really interesting. Just right. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. So, well, you mentioned you're not working on any future pop arrangements right now, but is there anything that, like, in the back of your head, you one one day might dig out, like Bowie? Any Bowie music? I mean, I love Black Star, for example. Yeah, I. You know, I always find that um, the best work comes from the deepest passion. Um, a friend of mine, Meryl Gunneman, um, is a pianist I've known since the 80s. And uh, she's, she's done lots of classical, but she's done lots of her own arrangement. And she has done such an incredible job with Bowie's music. We actually shared the stage at a show she put on about a year ago. Meryl, M-E-R-A-L, and then Gunneman is G-U-N-E-Y-M-A-N. And all of her Bowie arrangements are, I mean, I, I, I don't, I really don't know if I could have ever done what she has wrought with these pieces. I don't love them as deeply as she clearly does. I mean, you, you haven't heard them. You should actually, I'm, I'm sure I have, uh, all of them on my YouTube channel. I, I, I cut that show together. And so you should uh, definitely go to my YouTube channel and, and check, check out Meral. I will do that. Yeah, I find that you're totally right, though. The best things come into existence, first of all, I think from need, but also from like a desire to do a good job, you know, like if just for the sake of doing something, it never really, you know, pans out the same way, you know, you got to really kind of be there for it. So, so where can guests or sorry, where can listeners learn more about you? you've got the YouTube channel? I mean, people should subscribe to that for sure. You're very prolific on there. Um, there's all kinds of great music, but uh, you've got your website. Is there any other places we should be following along? That's you know, the, you know. Follow me on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram. I'll, I'll be I'll be getting more busy and more productive as the, as the days progress. I bet the YouTube channel is going to be the place to be though. Okay, awesome. So check out his YouTube channel. I'll put a link to that in the description for today's episode. Um, was there anything else you'd like to share with the audience about about Radiohead or questions for me or anything like that? Well, it's just been so great to to you know just to to, to go along with you, Sean. It's been really a pleasure. Yeah, it's been a great interview. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This is fantastic. It's funny because if I look back on when I was first listening to your album, I think probably on the bus somewhere, coming home from the mall, skipping class in high school. <laughs> if you told me I'd talk to you one day, I wouldn't have believed it. So I want to say thank you, too, for your motion picture soundtrack version. It's just very beautiful. It's, I think if I could pick a favorite, I think that would be that would be mine. Do you have a favorite? You know, that, that's, that's my encore. And you know what? I think, you know, it, it really puts a definitive point on it, doesn't it? It does. It does. It's a, it's a perfect end to an album, I think. You know, I have one last question, actually. So you mentioned I was watching some Candlelight videos of yours before this call. And um, you said that you heard Tom York's favorite chord is B minor. What's yours? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was running gag in that show because I, I told them about it. And, I, and so I would give them a wink. Because because it's it, it's really never you know aside from exit music I don't know of any uh, of their songs in B minor. Not too common. Well, it's probably because it's hard to play on the piano in that key. But, and... no, but I, I think I think it's a guitar thing, and and I think and it goes back to my my whole thing of of you know, being you know bemoaning the fact that girls weren't interested in my octaves. It goes back to the fact that girls were never interested in piano players. They were always interested in guitar players. Because when you think of it, yeah, they were throwing themselves at Liszt, but it was because Liszt looked like Berlioz, who was a guitar player. That's what it was. <laughs> oh my God! And so when you listen, and so when you when, when you're when you're a guitar player, the B minor, it just sometimes it just is a passing chord. You know, it's between between things, and that's how Tom would use it. And I'm working on the Symphony Fantastique now in in Liszt's and my arrangement of the Berlioz and you realize how many of those harmonies that he uses come from absolutely the idea of having 
one or several guitars attack this piece. How, how it never could have come from exploring things on the piano. So yeah, guitar players are just the best musicians, I guess. <laughs> so wait, what's your favorite chord then? Is it? Did I miss that? I don't, I don't, oh, I don't, don't have, have one, one because I have all of them oh, right here. Oh, I see. You have all of them available. Okay. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. All the chords. That's a, that's a fair answer, actually. <laughs> well, thank you so much again for coming on the show today. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. And I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And uh, next time you're back in Calgary, let me know. Oh, yes. I definitely will. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much for listening to OK Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and tell a Radiohead friend of yours who is just as big on the band as you are about this radio program. I would love to get more people interested and involved, and I'd love to hear your story. I'd also love to hear any guest suggestions you have or any other feedback, so don't hesitate to get in touch. I do respond to every message I receive, and I love to hear from people all over the world who are listening to the show. You can contact me. My name's Sean at hello at okpodcast.com. Thank Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next time on OK Podcast, the show for Radiohead fans. To support the production of today's radio program and to access extended episodes, please visit okpodcast.com slash subscribe.